Hello. Yes. Hey, hello. Hi, Miko. We are live. It's so exciting. Yeah. I'm meeting you from Liechtenstein. Where are yeah. you? I'm in uh, sunny Silicon Valley. It's morning here. Okay. Exciting. I mean, I know you since a very long time. But um, before we get started, um, I want to give you kind of one or two words. Like, can you introduce yourself? Who are Abs you? Absolutely. Since we're doing kind of a live internet, uh, one of the easy, quick ways to find out about me is just to go to miko.com, M-I-K-O.com. Uh, I have a, basically a long entrepreneurial background. So I've been 30 years here in Silicon Valley, mostly working on open source software and technology startups since the introduction of the Java programming language, uh, of which I was a uh, the, I guess, chief evangelist. So, you know, really excited to see 25 years of Java technology, great technology, and, uh, you know, it's going well. So having looked at this technology and open source for about 25 years here in Silicon Valley, uh, I've really been involved in open source software. So, you know, it's until recently I got more involved in blockchain as open source technology. And, uh, you know, I, I co-founded uh, Evercoin Exchange, and I also joined a investment fund called Gumi Cryptos Capital. So um, pretty excited about uh, blockchain technology, obviously. And I'm also uh, advisor, I guess, long time now advisor to Monty and LCX. So, you know, uh, fantastic, uh, you know, being, being part of that. Perfect. And we are so glad to have you on board. You know, um, I can tell our viewers and our community that we know each other since a long time even before I got into LCX, um, I'd been still investing with Digital Leaders Ventures back in the days, and we bumped into all different kind of events and, and conferences. We sometimes even had you as a guest speaker as well. So I know you as a, a evangelist on all different kind of technology topics, and now especially around blockchain and crypto. I think the last time we met was at a, at a special family office event in Monaco, uh, which was kind of a private gathering. And I'd love to travel, but the last uh, months had been very productive just by staying here at home or staying staying uh, in our my empty office, uh, more or less, here in Liechtenstein. Um, and so for the rest of the audience who doesn't know me, I'm Monty Metzger. I'm the CEO, founder, and I'm chairman of the board at LCX. Um, I've been doing a lot of things in the past, but uh, we are here to build a, a compliant and regulatory infrastructure for the next growth wave of the industry. And we do this out of Liechtenstein. And I wanna show you something exciting. So next to my desk here, there's this beautiful window out to the castle. Oh, so I just wanna show you. So this is the castle view. It's a beautiful day today. And so there's the, the Liechtenstein castle and we are like a few minutes uh, walking to the city center. So you have to come um, soon personally. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. Uh, you know, it's it's so wonderful to connect uh, Silicon Valley today geographically with uh, Liechtenstein because, uh, you know, it's it's really kind of this sort of place of bleeding edge new technology. And then there's really kind of a sense of history and culture and you know legitimacy and so it's a it's such an amazing thing to see the castle and you know to know that you're you're you know you're yeah. right over there so the castle is actually in use so the the prince of Liechtenstein is it's his residency office everything there are people working in there every day and Liechtenstein really stands out because it has this deep history of as a financial marketplace with a triple a rating at standard and poor's that's the highest rating you can get as a country um, Liechtenstein is probably an hour away from, from Zurich um, to Zurich Airport, so right next door also to Zug Crypto Valley, and it's landlocked between Switzerland and Austria. It's the sixth smallest country in the world, and um, with the kind of financial powerhouse and the information they have in the background, um, it's really a good place to do financial business. But since two years, the government had been working on the new blockchain laws, and I'm probably tell a little bit more later in this in this talk but first let's ask our audience on youtube where are you from 
maybe you can comment in the uh, in the comment section with the flag or the country or city you are in so let us know where you are we want to learn where all of you are and we have collected all your questions um there have been over 100 questions coming in we uh, screened the community to telegram chat twitter and then also we had a form we collected it all in in one document um, discussed it with Miko prior to that and we'll try to answer everything and as much as possible within this one hour time frame so i think we have a hard stop but we can get a lot of things done and even more exciting there will be a demo and we'll show a couple of cool new concepts and features um, from LCX as well. I'm, I'm excited because I'm seeing the live stream too. And, uh, you know, I just want to shout out to uh, Pedro. Uh, you know, there's some pretty amazing folks coming in. Uh, Ian from Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, you know, we've got a, a whole bunch of folks from all over. Pedro's from Peru, which is pretty cool. Mark from the Netherlands. Uh, Gareth from Medellin, Colombia. Uh, we've got uh, Gina from Georgia, so you know Germany, Sweden, Philippines. Uh, you know we got we just have a terrific international audience today. That's right, and it is a very international topic as well. While we are here, in like in the middle of Europe, um, we already see that the growth is really coming from all different kind of of sections. So when I look at all the questions, when we screamed it through, I think. The first initial question um, would be like, what's the status of the company? Where are you? Um, and so that's probably where, where I want to get started with. And, and then we'll kind of do a ping pong. So I think every time when there is something around uh, market insights and general questions, I will hand over to you, Miko. And then if there's something specific on LCX, I will answer um, probably as a, as a short note. Um, I'm whether a lawyer, uh, not a technology uh, person, I know HTML and PHP and basics. Um, and of course, I learned a lot about Ethereum, blockchain, and everything else. Um, but we can't do any legal advice and we have to be um, kind of sensitive in some things because uh, what applies to LCX might not apply to other companies. So that said, what's the status of LCX? Miko, we kept you updating since um, you joined as an advisor. We incorporated in April 2018. So it's now over two years um, ago. We planned to incorporate the company in Liechtenstein because of the new regulatory framework, which now had been passed in on October 3rd last year, 2019. So it took longer than expected but the laws are now in full force since January 1st, 2020. On top of that, we have so far invested roughly two and a half million dollars into the company. It's a AG, like a, a Aktiengesellschaft here in, in Germany. Um, uh, LTX is registered here at Herrenstraße, so it's uh, just very close to the city center. And um, we've increased the shared capital to, uh, to a million Swiss francs now to um, further, which we need for the further licensing. Um, a key element on how we tackle the market entry was, you know, we are building um, the framework in a compliant and regulated manner for the next growth wave of the industry. And we see the next growth wave coming in tokenization of new assets, in creating new interesting asset classes which investors want to trade and want to invest in. And we see that it needs to have a certain new level of investor protection and also kind of clarity. And that's why we are we are in Liechtenstein. The strategy, core strategy is really that uh, we are ultimately building a security token exchange. And to do that, we need um, traders, we need cool assets, and we need the underlying exchange platform. Our market entry strategy was that, you know, as we're building kind of an eBay marketplace, we need good users and clients and investors first. That's why we launched LCX Terminal as the first initial step to um, have a market entry and building up a, a growing community. And we've announced 10,000 users in December. And since then, 
just have a, a look at our token price. It had been growing and growing. Same for the user base. We'll issue um, a blog post soon with kind of the overall total numbers on it. But um, there had been a, a lot of growth there already. And as we're building the community there who are exposed to crypto assets, um, and we've already achieved kind of an active user base who are using L6 terminal, um, we're now looking at the next phase. And that's something which we want to announce and um, proclaim today. And that's the kind of firing up the next growth phase of LCX with um, the introduction of the L LCX STO launch pad. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at digital assets, security tokens to be launched and um, expose our current user base and probably new ones to this new asset class. So hopefully they will also like to invest and be part of that. And then the next growth phase, probably also coming um, at, at some point of time in the future will be then the fully regulated exchange. But doing that doesn't make sense to do it now because we don't have any assets and we are building up the user base. So I think these phases are important to understand on how we enter the market. We also learned that the market is not developing as fast as we thought. Um, so what's your take, Miko, on the kind of tokenization of assets? You've been following it. Will that be something which is happening tomorrow or is it already here? What's your feeling in the market? <clears throat> So uh, I think that security tokenization is a big deal. Uh, obviously, it's really part and parcel of this revolution of blockchain technology and, you know, what I call open source financial infrastructure. So the way I reason about this is really, I think, based on my history, which is I've been in Silicon Valley for about 30 years years. And, you know, when I got started, open source was really just this crazy bunch of hippies, you know, so you, people with gray neck beards and talking about, uh, you know, weird Unix operating systems, you know, it, Linux was hardly even on the map at the time. So, you know, it, it was hardly anything that anyone expected, right? So the thing that we've seen is we've seen open source kind of utterly dominating, you know, all infrastructure technology. So, the reason why I'm going through a long preamble is I want people to understand that um, open source technology is inevitable. And so, you know, the idea of blockchain being an underpinning for financial infrastructure, you know, it's part of the revolution of open source financial infrastructure. And really, once open source financial infrastructure takes hold, uh, there are only beneficiaries. Like, so whether it's a government or whether it's a corporation or individuals, like there are only beneficiaries and then nobody else. And what I mean by nobody else is if you're not a beneficiary of open source, you're really not really part of the economy, right? So, so when we talk about the tokenization of assets, we're really just talking about the migration of, uh, you know, financial securities from non-blockchain uh, to blockchain, right? So, you know, that that migration is, I think, an inevitability. Obviously, one of the things that, you know, we are always, uh, you know, careful about when we talk about financial assets is things like market timing. We're very careful to talk about things like pricing. And we're, we, you know, we're careful when we talk about prediction of specific assets, because obviously, those are forward looking statements. So, you know, to me, uh, it isn't, necessarily you know for me i'm mostly thinking about this from a technology perspective here in silicon valley and you know my mood is is that you know the conversion of the global financial system into open source financial infrastructure is is absolutely inevitable security token is part of that and i think what's happening you know in terms of the gradual approach is that really what we're trying to determine are you know what are the pioneer species, what are the killer applications, what are the earliest uh, types of securities that would greatly benefit from this new, both the regulatory infrastructure with, you know, things like Liechtenstein Blockchain Act, and then, you know, also technology infrastructure, like open source financial infrastructure and blockchain. So these are the, I think, big movers that are starting to enable this so-called SDO marketplace. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the future of this topic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, another key question from the community was really, what's our status of the licensing process and what is the, the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act at all? So um, before we dive into that, 
did you, you know, I have been uh, with Digital Leaders Ventures, we invested in all different kinds of industries from AI to also FinTech, but with blockchain, it was kind of, especially blockchain regulation and the role of public policies and governments, I really saw that it was the first time that governments and countries had been competing with like come to us um, and, and trying to compete in terms of regulatory framework. So, you know, there have been Malta, Crypto Island, uh, Blockchain Island or whatever they, they call themselves and then Singapore, Gibraltar, um, all, this, all these jurisdictions. Which, um, like, did you follow the, the regulatory development on, on blockchain markets as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's absolutely in essential about this global regulatory schemes are that, you know, it's important to understand that this is the nature of this uh, open source uh, type of revolution, which is that it's borderless and it's based in the internet, right? But yeah. the thing that's very interesting is that businesses are not borderless and businesses are not, you know, uh, floating in cyberspace, you know, they're all grounded in jurisdiction, right? And jurisdiction is, re and uh, uh, investors are also. Right. So investors are all jurisdictional and all investors and investment, you know, should be 100 percent compliant with, you know, the the domicile regulatory frameworks. Right. So to me, that's one of the exciting parts. And one of the things, you know, obviously having known uh, Monty since pre my, you know, uh, involvement in blockchain, you know, so all of his work in Silicon Valley coming here with uh, executives and things, you know, so be, because of this kind of longstanding feeling, you know, I think it's exciting to understand that he's doing some very pioneering work with the regulatory uh, authorities in Liechtenstein. So, you know, I think that that's really interesting to understand. I'd love to kind of have you comment a little bit more on sort of the, you know, really what's specifically happening you know in that geography so we really decided to come here and the key reason was the, the regulatory framework that been now approved so and it also reflects on where we are in the licensing process because until like end of 2019 um there was no regulation crypto assets basically was, was unregulated as in a lot of other um, markets and only if you would touch like banking laws or financial licenses, it, it, it would have an impact. But uh, for us, Liechtenstein is really the most exciting jurisdiction for blockchain companies on the globe at the moment. I think the way the Blockchain Act and the blockchain laws are structured are a very holistic uh, view on the industry. And it's not regulating only one piece of the puzzle, but really uh, every piece or every step in a value chain of creating tokenized assets. So what do I mean by that? First of all, they see the token as a container. It's called the token container model where you can fill the token with any right. And it could be also like a music right, a copyright, a utility right. You can have like a voucher, but also a value like a payment token. And of course, any financial asset, real estate, bonds, funds, whatever. So this is uh, a kind of a fundamental change because the token is seen as a legal instrument. And then they have created 10 different roles and licenses um, as part of the Blockchain Act. And it starts with a physical validator who is actually checking if, if you're tokenizing an asset that's actually here, that you're not selling it to a third party. And this role is a libel role. So if you... Um, like if there's a mistake there at the beginning of tokenization, obviously the whole rest has an error in it as well. So that's important with the physical validator. Then there are token issuer, token generator, token depository, physical, um, the physical validator already said, uh, the exchange service provider. So that's one part as well. Verifying authority an identity service provider and a price service provider. And I will come back to these roles later, what you can do with it. In, in our strategy piece. But it's you can see it's like laying out a whole um, kind of variety of different roles. And now it's also up to the market and to the industry like us to say, okay, what do we do with it? What is interesting? Where do we actually use these roles for the future? Um, as of 1st of January, every blockchain company in Liechtenstein has to file a notice to the Financial Market Authority 
authority to say, we are doing these kind of things. And obviously LCX is here, so we had to do this as well. Um, now in 2020, there is a grandfathering process and we had been approved uh, for seven of the 10 uh, licenses already with the grandfathering. We didn't announce it yet because, you know, we will um, do it once it's an official registry and once all the like final questions had been um, answered, we filed a lot of documents. And for that also, we hired a new head of compliance as of January this year and um, like a real pro and expert who've done licensing for uh, Liechtenstein blockchain companies in the past. And that's why we've like produced a lot of paper and no, they go deep. I don't know um, how it's in other jurisdictions, but they want to know a lot of things on custodianship, on technology, database, backends, security, everything. Um, and there's a huge knowledge in, in, with the people over there as well. So important steps for us. And um, yeah, and certainly kind of laying out the foundations for additional um, processes on that, and on that stage. But we see the opportunity um, on a compliant and more secure environment for the investors, for a community who is listening now. Basically, you don't want to have any, any, any frauds or anything happening over there. You now have legal certainty. So you can anytime go uh, to court in Liechtenstein and force rights with, with, for a token you have bought or whatever. So, um, and, and there are rules to it. So also for the issuer, like we have issued a token, a utility token. So we also know um, what, what rights are associated with it and everything. So it's, it's good, yeah. Do you think this will kickstart the, the blockchain industry? Do they all yeah. now come to Liechtenstein after our call here? Uh, I think one of the key points I want to set on within your case is, is that, you know, there is a big kind of battle cry in so-called decentralized finance and that this is really this idea that code is law. But I think that that's really been challenged of late, you know, and I think that the thing that I think is really becoming clear is that law is law, right? And so, so to me, the idea that you have uh, a high degree of regulatory involvement and participation, the idea that you have kind of a lot of scrutiny and that, that uh, you know, basically uh, investors have legal rights. You know, all of these things I think are really important and the framework within which they have those rights is extremely important because there's a, there's a Absolutely. tremendous history as you can look out the window and see a castle, you know, there's a great history of defending of rights and there's a great history of this idea of Liechtenstein as establishing itself as a financial center yeah. through these kind of uh, legal structures, right? So, so to me, I think, you know, having legal certainty is, is really helpful. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the expert or specialist on Liechtenstein legal regulation and certainty. So, you know, I can't really comment on all the specifics details, but, you know, what I do encourage people to do is to think about very broadly the legal framework in which they're investing and to make sure that they do have rights, right? Because, you know, in certain token schemes, users don't have any rights at all. They have no legal rights, you know, and sometimes even in a contract to purchase these types of assets, it says you literally on the document, it says you have no rights, you know, so it's, yeah. it's you know, that that's, that's, so, you know, and whatever you're investing in, please look into it and please understand both the contract you're signing to invest and also try to understand the legal jurisdiction in which you have either authority or you have no authority, right? So I think these are really key key points uh, as we start to mature as an industry. Absolutely. And we see how the industry is evolving and there is a, a new level of complexity uh, at the moment because there are more and more platforms and exchanges do you know how many crypto exchanges are there now? Yeah, I don't have an exact count, but what I can tell you is, is that there are absolutely hundreds of exchanges uh, scattered all across the globe. There's, you know, definitely hundreds of ju different jurisdictions, you know, so it's ex exceedingly complex. You know, typically what happens is, is that users and you guys can all comment in the live stream chat, too, you know, which is that 
uh, typically a user will actually use multiple exchanges, you know, to handle different types of assets that they may be interested in. Uh, they may have non-custodial exchanges or wallets that they may want to kind of hold assets in for their security, you know, just a personal cybersecurity purpose. So, you know, it, it, most, most people who are sophisticated are actually using multiple exchanges, you know, even as individuals, right? So the, the whole thing is, I think, probably exceedingly complex. Yeah, you know, there are probably uh, quite quite a bit too many uh, exchanges at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And that brings us to kind of the next um, phase here in our chat around our current business. And we want to solve this complexity by offering a tool where you have one dashboard and one platform, you can manage your whole crypto portfolio. And I just show you how it looks. Um, so uh, doing screen sharing, this is the LCX terminal as it is today. So this is a software as a service product. Anybody can go there and sign up. Um, you can connect up to 15 cryptocurrency exchanges and then manage your whole portfolio all on one desk. And we also collected some numbers here. So we uh, currently have over 5,249 um, trading pairs, total trading pairs, and they're unique trading pairs. You know, Bitcoin against Ethereum might be duplicated on some. So we have 2,849 unique trading pairs, which you can manage on LCX terminal. We have roughly $250,000 in trading volume per day. And um, especially in April and May, we had thousands of trades executed um, wire our platform per day as well. And we'll do an update blog on these numbers uh, probably in the next one or two weeks with also a kind of a key milestone in, in the user base. But so besides managing that here, um, what is quite exciting is you have um, in the markets overview, um, you can go into different um, assets quite easily. So you can check out where LCX um, is, is traded and um, obviously uh, let's jump in liquid LCX uh, there you go and then you can go in and see see the whole like price history um, how it uh, went up and uh, what are the kind of trading order book uh, look like and you can do like deep analysis another point is news so always have your news at your finger desks so you have that in nice uh, visual or in just like the headline of it. And um, what is also nice, kind of some um, price alerts, which also push to Telegram if you want. So you can have your favorite trading pair there. And um, most importantly, um, you can execute the trades directly here manually. And then we launched something which kind of drove also adoption and usage, which is called smart order. And that's known from the FX and traditional trading environment already. You can um, choose a trading pair, um, let's take just Ethereum against BTC. Um, you can sell or buy. You can immediately then say um, which of your exchanges are offering that. And you always see the best bid and best ask uh, immediately and also the spread. So what the smart order uh, does, it, it will always give you the best price and it will execute in a smart way. So if you do a smaller trade, and I've prepared something this morning, um, for example, buying 0.2 Ethereum, it will execute it immediately with the best price. In this case, it was on, on KuCoin. If you have um, a larger order, as a test, I did 0.8 Ethereum, it uh, will be then executed across different exchanges automatically, and then put into your wallets on the exchanges. So here you are always trading on your kind of uh, accounts you have on the different exchanges. We are evaluating on how we could take the business model further and give you even more ease of use. But that's terminal. Um, any questions, Miko, on this? Uh, you know, I guess my question would be, um, you know, I really like the smart order routing feature. I think that's pretty exciting. Um, I guess, I guess my big question would be, you know, how do you see your roadmap? So, you know, what's, what's coming up next? You know, how, how mm -hmm. do you see that uh, for this? So 
I think in, in terms of the roadmap, what we've done since launch, so this product had been launched June last year. And um, so it had been like a year in the market almost, um, had been growing. And especially in the, in the first couple of months, we learned a lot in terms of handling customer success, client success, like what are the steps to increase um, the usage uh, flow. So the user interface that you don't lose people on the, on the go. On the other hand, it is um, the underlying technology which will trigger a lot of our other additional products. So on the one side, we'll stay in this um, market area and say, how can we increase um, or in introduce products which are useful for our traders? Um, this could be more automation, um, more convenience in terms of um, depositing the funds at LCX and then trading automatically without even opening other accounts. Like all these concepts are evaluating and um, I think depending on the directions on the on our client base and customer base, we will then roll it out step by step. So, 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 so Monty, just, just real quick, uh, you know, like obviously this is a very compelling user interface and a exciting demo, but you know, can you, can you give us some numbers? Like what, what's the status of this? You know, how real is it? it you know, is it, is it live? Like, you know, can people really get the order routing done? Like, you know, are the orders really being routed? Like, you know, how, are, are people really trading? Like, you know, how, how, what are the numbers like? Yeah, so numbers are growing. I think I, I mentioned a few, so I'll, I'll repeat. So there are over 5,000 trading pairs you can access over the 15 exchanges. We have um, a thriving user base of tens of thousands of active users. Um, and so update will, will follow on the, on the total number. And we have roughly 250,000 in trading volume, $250,000 of trading volume executed on via our tool here. And even more important, as you said, it's a sophisticated platform. It will help us for future other products. And one key element is really the, um, what we call accounts, LCX accounts. We can already kind of get a little feeling what we have in mind. So first of all, accounts comes with the link here to L6 terminal. And as you can see, there are some spaces left for additional other products, which we might then have there as uh, filled up step by step. At the same time, the account comes with wallets. So you have at the moment, LCX, BTC and ETH wallets. You can manage your wallets there already. And obviously handling that and taking responsibility of user funds is something where we had been taking slow steps to make it really secure, uh, easy to use and also convenient, but also following back to these laws, the, the trusted technology key depository and token depository are licensed roles. Basically custodianship is a licensed role under the blockchain act. So obviously we are following here and in dialogue to um, actually not only make it technology wise secure, but also legally wise. A new feature which we introduced a few days ago is that you can buy and purchase an LTX token right out of the, your LTX accounts. We are um, taking the liquid market prices. So you can go in and say, I want to buy 1000 LCX. Um, the price is always taking every 30 seconds from, from liquid and then you can buy and they are immediately executed then and you'll find them in your wallet. So that's a new feature. And then we have some rewards and activities also to keep our community active. But this process where you um, sign up and um, go through your profile. So this is obviously all test here, um, you do your security uh, features, your KYC and the whole investment onboarding. This is key for a lot of other projects we are, we are launching and products because we aim to have one account for all different kinds of things. So if you have an LCX account, you already are approved or like part of the uh, products which are coming. So depending on, for example, the security token offerings we are doing, depending on your jurisdiction and the, the individual token offering, you will be then notified and you don't have to log in again. I think that's a key element of user experience. Yeah, so that's LCX Terminal. Any um, additional questions, Miko?
I think there was a question from the community that about uh, whether there's additional exchanges that need to be uh, that will be integrated uh, into the LCX terminal. True, there are more exchanges coming, and we are evaluating. We are also working with the exchanges itself because you know, as you could imagine, um, this tool is lead generation for them. So we are guiding users to their exchange as well. So. We're doing marketing corporations and there are a few exchanges who are highly interested to work on that. And um, so it won't stay with the 15, there are more coming and we'll announce it step by step. Um, also like on our website um, at lcx.com slash partners, we, you can see all um, our partners and um, there might be one or two exchanges coming on top of that. And you can also see the importance of the um, kind of a real good official price. And so that's something which came up from the community as well. Um, I saw the question, what are our LTX reference prices um, and why are they relevant? So these are published here. Um, before I explain what we do, what's the relevance of price in, in the crypto industry? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's I mean, such a big price oracles yeah. are all over, isn't it? Yeah. So just to be really clear, like one of the things that's the most important thing about what's happening, you know, I mentioned DeFi or decentralized financial services. And, you know, one of the things that's happening that's a huge struggle is oracles, right? And oracles are, so let me just explain for the audience, just, you know, who aren't maybe super nerdy, like, like myself, uh, you know, Oracle is basically, uh, there's on-chain information which you can trust, right? So for example, if Bitcoin blockchain says, oh, I have a transaction between Alice and Bob, Alice has paid Bob, you know, one, one Bitcoin, you know, so if, if you, if you believe that, you know, what happens is eventually that the consensus causes that to be written into the blockchain after confirmation. So once confirmation has occurred, blockchain data becomes, you know, uh, reliable. People look at the Bitcoin blockchain and they think, I trust what has been written to the blockchain by the block producers and or validators and or whatever you want to call them, the nodes that, you know, win the block race, right? So the thing about an Oracle is an Oracle is moving data from places that are not blockchains onto a blockchain, right? So what it does is it potentially pollutes trust because, you know, an Oracle can basically say anything it wants. Uh, you know, so you could basically write uh, nonsense. You can write utter nonsense into a blockchain and that nonsense can't be trusted, right? And and so, you know, oracles uh, and prices, uh, how do you establish price and how do you define price? You know, because it's like, oh, I have a price. It's $10 for one Bitcoin. You know, <laughs> I mean, what a great price, please buy, right? So, you know, yeah. my point is, is that like uh, what's happened in DeFi is that oracles have been, uh, attack points. So people can set up things like denial of service attacks where they attack an Oracle. And then what happens is the price starts lagging. So it's not even the price right now. It's the price 10 seconds ago. And the point is the price 10 seconds ago, maybe slightly more, slightly less, even that amount of diversion mm -hmm. in an Oracle can cause huge amounts of money to be sucked out you know, essentially in the form of an attack, right? So I guess what the reason why I'm really kind of ranting about this topic because I think that people need to be careful and they need to understand blockchains and they need to understand where a blockchain is appropriate and they need to understand the approaches that organizations take. And the reason why I wanted to kind of like discuss this with you, Monty, is, is that what I really like about the LCX approach is the LCX approach is about blending logically things like decentralization, things like centralization, things like legal uh, comfort and legal uh, security and you know regulatory authority, and then com combining that with kind of uh, validation and and blockchain. So so to me, like you know maybe you can comment a little bit about how LCX uh, is dealing with the Oracle problem and how LCX deals with things like price, because you know I think that you know the, uh, these are big problems in in the broader blockchain world. You know, and obviously people say, oh, blockchain data should be trusted you know, it, it, not all blockchain data is, is, is born alike is, you know, so people need to be careful. Absolutely. I mean, all crypto investors know price is critical. Prices vary on different exchanges and platforms. There are arbitrage opportunities. And it's not only us who discovered this, but it's also 
the working group here in the Liechtenstein government who implemented this as a core feature. So uh, what we offer here is part of this so-called trusted technology price service provider. So you can say it's an official price where other um, as a foundation for other future products, which we will launching and other Liechtenstein companies might refer to our prices as well, because by the new lock blockchain laws, you have to take an official price as a conversion rate. So for example, if you buy a, an apartment with Bitcoin, you um, probably sign like a paper document um, saying, okay, I'll, I'll pay you 10,000 or like, let's rather say 500,000 uh, Swiss francs here for, for an apartment and you pay in Bitcoin, which conversion rate do you take? And then you look at, at CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko or um, CryptoCompare or whatever, and um, where to get an official price. And um, they're varying each minute and everything. So this, the Bitcoin reference price gives you um, one price per day, which is calculated with a specific algorithm there's a whole white paper there on how we actually do it and how we calculate it. And therefore we wanna give one price per day where you can always go back and say now, like two days ago, the price here was 8,826. So you know, when you did the contract on this day and bought the apartment, you can just always go back and, and, and see what's the price. And um, on the technology side, it's, um, we can't manipulate it. It's an uh, algorithm behind. We would like to technology also be improved. Maybe um, uh, there, there are a few opportunities there. And then on the other hand, there's a legal certainty and the legal clarity, which um, only in Liechtenstein with the blockchain laws are existing. I know that some other providers are offering price services, but, but they're not licensed like ours. So that's quite exciting. And it will be um, kind of a play a key role for tokenization, for example. So um, should we jump to the next topic, Miko? Absolutely. I just want to get a couple of community questions in off the YouTube stream. You know, so one of the quick questions, just very briefly, is you know, how is LCX similar and different from Harbor, Securitize, Polymath? So you know, I can kind of maybe try to spin it a little bit and try to keep it quick, but I just want to get that question in front of you. But you know, I think that Harbor and Polymath are really STO only, so they're not really involved in kind of bitcoin and cryptographic asset exchange but you know yeah. maybe maybe you can talk a, just I, I don't want to go too long on it but i just want to make sure the you know youtube people are getting getting questions answered because you know they, yeah. they deserve our yeah. attention so so maybe then we jump into this because it's also a very important topic so i think in our um questions uh, it's also this growth phase number two and we call it the sto launchpad uh, or like more casually, a tokenization engine. And what do we mean with that a tokenization engine? Um, so first of all, we see the, the potential of tokenization as the next growth wave for the whole blockchain industry, which might go um, and grow much, much bigger than what we currently are in. Um, and, and the reason is that you combine the technology with kind of a, um, an infrastructure which is known from the financial markets. So, you know, I always quote um, there the saying that blockchain is to the money what email was to the letter. So we are taking blockchain and putting it into financial markets and create some efficient, cool things. If you compare us to these other companies, I mean, I don't know all the details about them, but what I've noticed is Harbor, for example, tried to do real estate tokenization and it didn't happen. Like it, they more or less failed with raising um, and selling out. So they, um, I think it was an equi hire or something that, uh, so Harbor's closed down, team moved on. Um, and we've seen a lot of real estate projects now emerging, but a key problem is that it can be a very exciting apartment or house or um, other kind of more commercial real estate, which had never been accessible to um, private investors and you tokenize it but you have to go out and do the whole marketing because nobody knows about your offering and, and everything. And, and you have to spend a lot of marketing dollars. We take a different approach. So first of all, we are building up the community already. So we have a thriving community of investors who would probably like to invest into a new asset class as well in security tokens. 
And the second approach is that we are going into different SS classes. Um, we have announced the teamwork with um, a Hollywood production house, uh, also with the actor Wesley Snipes. Last fall, we've been intensively working on this and there will be some announcement following, but I can tell you already, um, a key structure has, has changed. It's not, uh, or let's say it's now called the Daywalker Movie Assets. Uh, so the token is called DMA and it's an entertainment project. So basically um, it's exciting movies with directors and other actors in it um, who will all talk about how the movie will be financed. Obviously this will create a huge buzz wave of um, PR and um, social media craziness and everything. So we don't have to spend a single marketing dollar to get the word out. And I'm, I'm confident and it will have good reaction or even maybe sold out uh, pretty soon because everybody want to want to be part of something like that um, and support movies. And, you know, instead of buying merchandising a T-shirt, you buy something like that. And if the movie is successful, you get full returns uh, on, on your investment there as well. And so all these details around it will be published um, soon, soon in regulatory words, so we don't really know it, but it's not uh, years away, it's not half a year away, it's probably weeks, uh, months, um, stay tuned, very exciting project. And this will be the first on our LCX STO launchpad where people can subscribe. All the users who are there on our platform already, they can um, have access already. And um, yeah, and then I can, can show you a little bit more insights any question from you on this so far, Miko? Uh, no, just a quick comment. I mean, obviously, like any, I, I can't really, you know, endorse any specific kind of security or any kind of financial instrument, you know. But what I can say, you know, is that I did meet uh, Wesley Snipes, you know, in Puerto Rico at uh, Crystal and Brock's place, uh, actually it was Crystal's house. And, you know, we, we did have a chance to talk a little bit about this stuff. And, and I was quite impressed actually. He's, uh, you know, he's quite a intelligent, charming character and, you know, he's, he's an innovator. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, Wesley Snipes is pretty well known as an actor and, but he's also, I think a pretty sa savvy, you know, business person. And, you know, I think he understands this kind of emerging tech stuff, which I was surprised by, um, you know, obviously not an endorsement of any, uh, you know, financial asset or anything of the sort, you know, and, and, you know, I think movies are, are, you know, fairly complex, but at the same time, you know, I'm excited about the launch of, you know, security tokens on the launch pad. You know, I think that's exciting. Uh, I guess yeah. uh, I, I'm curious to, to kind of understand um, for you, like, um, you know, how, how do you see uh, it, like LCX kind of licensing around STOs? Like, do you, do you have a specific mm -hmm. STO license? Like, what is, what's the status of that? Yeah, it's not that easy, unfortunately, but um, I can show you something um, which is a, a framework. Um, so this is a visual map of the Liechtenstein blockchain laws and how our products might fit in. Oh, wow. So in the inner circle, the red circle, you can see um, the, the terms I've um, mentioned before, so TT, Identity Service Provider, for example, TT stands for Trusted Technology, Blockchain, DLT, and everything. Um, so these are the roles which are um, basically very interesting for us and which we have been in this grandfathering mode now. It's a TT Identity Service Provider. So we um, have to that accounts where we do KYC, know your customer, we check passports, AML checks in the background. Um, and then there's a physical validator where we call STO due diligence. So we actually look at the projects we do. And here in this movie production a case, for example, we, we of course, Wesley Snipes is kind of the actor in, in the, the face to the front, but it's actually important to work with the production house, his managers, um, the whole production team, because in this case, we are tokenizing a, a production studio to um, four or five movies. And um, so we want to know, is that legit? How do they do it and everything? Then there's the token generator and token issuer part where we are a licensed token issuer and a token generator. So we create the DMA token that's part of the tokenization process and it will be put on the SDO launchpad. Then there is a depository um, part of it. And then obviously um, 
we aim to also provide a trading venue as a TT exchange service provider. Um, in terms of the, the rollout here, we are um, probably launched with um, non-security tokens first, also to test and grow the platform um, to um, do something like that. And then at a later point of time, we'll also like, obviously when we have more and more STOs coming, uh, we wanna then launch the security token exchange let me, as well. Let, let, me, let me bounce into kind of the stream. We've got some really, you know, a bunch of really quick questions and I'd love mm -hmm. to kind of like just knock them out because, you know, give, give satisfaction to the folks out there uh, who are, Kind of really busily typing away. So you know, one of the ones uh, from uh, Tapacorn is he yeah he asked about the integration with hard wallets like uh for example the Nano Ledger, you know I have both Ledger and Trezor you know as well as uh, Evercoin you know but uh, how how do you think about hardware and hardware wallet? It's essential. Yeah. So you know, Ledger is one of our partners from the beginning. We're using Ledger Vault, the, the commercial product. And so um, there you have uh, a solution which is with multi-signature, several devices and several walls in different locations, everything highly secured. Um, and at the same time for our users, it's also a way to secure the, um, their assets. And obviously that's something which we'd like to integrate as well. As you've seen on L6 account, it's currently we do the custodianship, also part of kind of the key depository, token depository, Kind of this vault and custodianship which is a licensed role so um, there's something where we are taking responsibility plugging in um, ledger walls or like nano s or whatever that that would be a cool feature and we'd like to do that it's on a roadmap but um Couple additionally quick, to that, uh, so, yeah. Sorry, I don't want to go too deep on that one, but, uh, you know, Jay actually wants to know, uh, you know, Monty, do you have a date in mind for Launchpad? Yeah, so Launchpad is available as of today. Um, and we will, right after this call, we will activate a website where you can read the details, which I show here, and also the way to kind of sign up as a user. The asset, the first asset will be the DMA token. So... Um, basically, um, I, I'll show you how it looks um, in a second. Um, so this, this will then be activated uh, once um, the final steps are there for the approvals. So, and um, just a quick overview on the, on the launch pad itself. What is we, we're looking for at the moment is, as we now know, we've gone through this painful process of learning how to do all the elements. We'd now like to kind of look for other projects. So we are opening up, there will be a form um, where people can pro like pitch or apply for their projects. And we will like to do many, many other security token offerings and with a special combination because we have a um, proprietary technology platform for issuing security tokens, managing them, the sale, the distribution, the fully compliant and, and enforceable on the platform and token level. Um, and then we have LCX accounts, which you saw for investor onboarding, real time, uh, real time cap table management, and it's one account for all STOs. That's on the left side. On the right side, you can see that's kind of really sets us apart because you can go out and take a, any white label solution for your STO, but you don't have the user base. Um, so you need to do a lot of marketing and um, you're probably left in the dark with the legal side. And as we're like, we are not legal advisors, we have our partners, but we have now built a legal toolkit. So what we want to achieve with that is to speed up the whole process from months, years to like down to weeks to go from, from idea to STO um, and fundraising or um, the STO issuing and everything uh, within, within a much shorter time frame and much less cost. At the same time, the bottom right is the framework uh, which we're leveraging, which I showed kind of the environment and, and the legal framework. So, based so, on Mon that. so Monty, what I'd love to do is, you know, we're definitely getting a bunch of questions, but I think that one of the big topic areas that might answer a bunch of these is tokenization, right? So I think people really want to know a little bit about kind of how the token works and, you know, how the LCX makes money through STO launch. The other quick one is kind of how many team members does uh, LCX have globally, you know, so it's really more about kind of like uh, the sort of pragmatics of the token. Yeah, absolutely. So these are questions in regards to our own token. 
uh, a lot. Yes. So the um, the LCX token itself is a utility token, and it's meant to be um, part of um, paying fees within our own infrastructure. So it will play a role here in the STOs. Currently, you can pay your fees with LTX terminal. So as, as you can see, the pro account for LTX terminal is 290 US dollars. Um, we have a minimum guaranteed utility value of 10 cents, so 0.1 dollars. And therefore, you only have to pay 2,900 LCX token per month for the subscription. So a lot of smart traders, they bought on external exchanges and then they used the token for the subscription at a, at a big discount. Um, and that's kind of the key concept of our utility token uh, within kind of the first product, but it will play a role in other products as well. Uh, we've done several like listings. I know that uh, another question is in regards to additional listings. We want to um, list on different additional exchanges. We are in constant discussion with a few big ones, tier one exchanges, and especially they are interested in also leveraging L6 terminal as a platform. So it will be kind of a win-win on both sides as well. And you know, at the moment we we had been listed on on one exchange per month or something. So uh, especially last two months or something, a lot of exchanges have been coming. So there will be more. And um, yeah, obviously uh, the token itself had um, seen some, some good growth. Uh, we're very excited about that. And it also drives us usage on our own uh, platform. So quick question, uh, you know, just want to make clarify, right, which is that, you know, there's a trading platform with real trades on it, but I'd love to understand kind of the timing and uh, regulatory status and readiness of the product on the STO side, right? Because those are two different things. So I want to make sure everyone understands that like Absolutely. those timings are different. So the STO platform is not kind of live and, you know, so we yeah. want to just help, help people. So I explained at the beginning of our call that we did the first growth phase of LCX, building a user base LCX terminal. And we are now starting growth wave two with STO and this tokenization engine. And for this also, um, we had been kind of working in the back end with our lawyers and uh, with our new head of compliance also um, to follow the licenses. So we kept our team and everything as efficient as possible. So the answer basically here is we are 10 full-time people now. And um, so we are small, highly efficient. And with the second growth wave now, I expect that we will hire a lot of additional people because we need more in customer support. We want to have one of the leading customer supports in the industry. We want, we need business development people. Uh, we need more community support and also on, on kind of on our partners, there will be additional partners joining us um, on, on like building the product, working with our utility token um, on the market making side, and a lot of exciting things. Miko, do you have 10 more minutes? Oh uh, yes, I I'm happy to extend. Okay, okay. So then we don't have to cut in three minutes and there we can extend a little bit. I'm happy about that. So I wanted to show you something and that's the LCX um, STO Launchpad. Um, on our demo and staging platform. That's the initial um, page when you land there. As you can see, it's already DMA branded. Um, there is a login with your LCX account. So this ASIC pass, how we named, now named it, that's your standard LCX account. You click on, on, on login and then you're um, going through um, this process here. Uh, fill in the information. If you have not, if you already done that, you will land on your dashboard. As you can see um, here, there's some Ethereum, some Bitcoin in there. Um, there's also a USDC uh, wallet integrated, my status and so on. And then I can click on invest. And that's, we try to keep it as simple as possible. You know, to keep it simple and stupid is, is key here. We are addressing also new users who are excited about the, the, the movie industry and not so much about blockchain. Um, so that's why it's a simple interface. You type in the amount of token you want to buy, let's say like 10,000 
Um, uh, security tokens, you then choose the, the wallet you want to you wanna use. Um, if you don't have any um, accounts here, it will show you, like, please send this amount to the address and then it, it, it will work. I'm now using the wallet, which is here, and I go buy, accept the terms and click confirm. And here it goes. So I'm now owner of 10,000 security tokens and they are now in my wallet. So that's the kind of key structure here of this um, STO launchpad. So this is how we will look like on the technology side. And with the legal toolbox um, we've created, we can now look into what else could we tokenize? What will be the next project? And the first projects we will do um, the whole process together with the partners. Um, we want to learn and not um, make any mistakes on that. So step by step, um, ramping it up. But once um, we are comfortable with that, we might be doing a lot of STOs on, on that platform and, and scale it up. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so should we uh, try to lean into, um, you know, any other additional key questions that people have? Uh, you know, I, I think. Yeah, uh, I think as timing ran out, um, we did. I think a lot of questions was in regards to our LCX token as well. And, and then there are probably questions on the STO launchpad and what we have in mind there. So um, let me just repeat here once again. So after the call, we'll activate a website. We'll find kind of the, our key concept about the STO launchpad and the form where projects can apply and say like, we have something we want to tokenize with LCX. And we go through them with them in a, in a, in a selection process and then do it together with them. And in the future term, we um, might be just onboarding existing STOs on our exchange, um, but that's a little bit further down the road. Overall, what you've seen in, in, the, in the call now is we're really taking a long-term view on this. We don't want to rush um, because we need to get it right and we need to build it step by step. And the industry is not evolving as quickly as we thought. We've seen it at other industry players who are kind of struggling to get um, liquidity on STOs. I think we are still very, very early um, and we have to take it step by step and probably also industry by industry. So we'll start with entertainment. We have some um, good partners who are now pitching other ideas in, in blockchain gaming or gaming industry, um, like Animoca Brands. Um, we have some great opportunities on the table. One of the question was, um, how many projects do you have? Like, what's the pipeline? I would say we have projects valued over 100 million US dollars in the pipeline now, which are seriously interesting to look at. Um, there's a, a, a fund we could tokenize. There's um, uh, other kind of media assets, which are very interesting. And the key criteria is we don't do projects where there's no user base. So we want to do projects where we immediately have a reach of millions of users and all of them have that. And so that's why um, it's very exciting. Um, yeah, what else should we like, let's save an, another like two or three minutes on the I'd, SEO um, I'd, topic I'd, and then- I'd, I'd love to touch something you alluded to and you know, and I think you are absolutely right to say that it's important to be building things properly and building things for the long haul. Uh, I really think that tone is very, very important. I love the kind of like imagery of looking at the castle of Liechtenstein, you know, cause we are talking about historical uh, event in, you know, and for me, when I think about the history of open source software it may only be a few decades old, but, and the history of Bitcoin and blockchain is, you know, less than two decades, you know, barely mm -hmm. one decade. So like the point that I would make is, is that, you know, I think Jay, who was on the, the chat actually said he thinks that STO may be two to three years out, you know, and I think the thing that is, is the key question about any exponential phenomena is sort of when does it become sort of, uh, you know, really go vertical? Like when does it really start taking off? You know, so I think what we are talking about is we're talking about the beginnings and we are talking about kind of this early stage 
uh, idea of this transition. It's, as far as the market timing, you know, I'm not great at prognosticating market timing. Uh, I have this crazy Silicon Valley tendency to think that things are happening earlier than than you know when they do happen. You know, but I, I would say Jay, you know. You know, when you talk about two to three year time frame for STO, like that may be the time frame for this uh, phenomenon to achieve almost the vertical, you know, to really start ex the, the serious exponential climb. But yeah. at the same time, it doesn't mean that early adopters are not going to produce sort of a meaningful interaction that produces meaningful companies, you know, and meaningful revenues, you know. So I, I think that it's it's important to kind of think about this broadly. Um, you know, that that being said, you know, I do think that it's, you know, it, it does take time for these things to develop, right? Because markets are, uh, you know, people are, are a little cautious about, you know, new markets. And, you know, I think rightly so. So, you know, I think we're going to see early adoption. And I think that's really, uh, you know, what we're likely to see in STO. True. I, I agree with you. And I tend to be on your side in terms of adoption, because um, I've been looking into future technologies um, since over 20 years and I've seen them come and go and what is hype and what is really something which is sustainable. And I know blockchain is here to stay and everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized. It is like the introduction of email to the information age is blockchain to kind of the internet of value. And we just don't know what will work what's the path we are taking. We know the vision, but we don't know um, kind of all the steps in between. So that's why it's easier for me to speak about the long-term vision than the steps we are going to take in two months because we are a startup. We, are, we have to be highly flexible on everything. And, and the key element which we discovered is there are plenty of white label tokenization platforms out there which give you kind of a good um, tool for yourself to do your own security token offering. Um, but it's a technology solution and we are combining the, uh, our own proprietary technology solution on a compliant and regulatory level with um, a legal infrastructure and a legal um, toolbox, which we're ready to actually scale it up. And that's really sets us apart with like being here in Liechtenstein um, I think we could be a role model in some industry saying once the legislation um, and a legal framework is set in other jurisdictions as well, they might be adapting it and then companies might be able to, to scale up over there as well. And we'd love to see more people coming to Liechtenstein and to the security token industry because if they succeed and become the next unicorn uh, company, we will be just right behind them or even a little bit further uh, in front of them. Yeah? So that would be good for the industry. And there's lots of room to grow. Um, yeah, I think that's... Well, good. Let me, let me zoom out a little bit and just kind of provide a few key takeaways that I've gotten from this session. So, you know, I'm always kind of grateful to get a chance to connect with you, Monty. You know, you're, you're always innovating and pushing the envelope. And, you know, I really feel like you're an outpost of Silicon Valley, you know, and you, you do have connections here. So, you know, I, I feel yeah. like for me, I think one of my big lessons out of this is, is that, you know, it's important now in this new phase to really think about who the players are, think about who the team is, think about who the jurisdiction is, you know, because to me, we're moving into a phase that's maybe a little bit less full of hype and, you know, much more grounded and pragmatic, you know. And so for me, I've what I've gotten out is I've gotten out that, you know, there's a team here of... 10 full-time employees that are producing shipping software and that that's real transactions happening on the software. And it's a real exchange with a real executive running it who has the long-term vision and is working, you know, hard. And I think the thing, the second point I'd like to make is that, um, I got a takeaway of the feeling that it isn't necessarily always about just pure blockchain as like, I would say a pure digital revolution, you know, but that, you know, legal systems matter, regulations matter, you know, uh, traditional finance still matters, you know, centralization still matters, you know, and so for oracles and prices and, you know, so the, the to me having a more reassuring legal framework and actually conferring legal rights to investors should not be considered 
overly conservative or, you know, traditional, you know, it's, it's almost common sense, right? So to me, having uh, regulatory and legal framework and safety and jurisdictional safety, these are, these shouldn't be optional, right? Uh, obviously, investors should have rights, and they, those rights should be conferred by regulatory authority. So that's my second point, you know, and then I would say the third point is, is that, you know, I think it's important to understand where we are in this broad roadmap and journey. And, I, you know, to me, I think it's very important to understand uh, kind of leadership and the tone set by leadership. So, you know, to me, I feel like, you know, Monty, your your tone, I think, is is calming and it's mature. You know, you're not hyping. You're not trying to sell anything. You know, you're really talking about, you know, essentially execution and you're talking about really the emergence of this phenomenon, you know, on both stages of the growth that you've described, right, which is really the primary exchange, which shows execution and delivery, right, you've got like order routing, like this stuff works, right, so you can go there, you can log in, and you can see it. So to me, like, that's real. But the second leg of this really relates to the STO platform. So for me, you know, I think that uh, having this kind of mature tone, I think, is very important for the growth of the industry, because I feel like, you know, the first wave of this kind of ICO phenomenon, you know, was filled with kind of too much hype. And, you know, we do need to be looking to leaders that have, you know, execution power, they have kind of maturity, they have stability, and they have this kind of uh, sense of uh, responsibility, you know, and accountability. So, you know, I, I think I think those those are my big three uh, takeaways, you know, so I think really it's related to kind of the timing of the markets, the maturity of the product and team, you know, and ultimately the kind of legal and regulatory framework uh, within which this product exists. So, you know, that's kind of what I got out of this. True. That's a good summary, I think, and um, good takeaways out of, out of this blockchain session here. You know, our, our team is always expanding. So next to me, um, I always have the support from our little crypto kitty, um, which I always have here on my desk. But to end up at the session, uh, there was kind of the most pressing question out of the community was really, who is this mysterious secret advisor, which we have at lcx.com slash about. There is a somebody which you can't see. And I have two answers for you. Um, a serious one and a fun one. Which do you want to hear first? Yeah, let's get the fun one first. Okay, so you know we I'm have some traders. My, uh, are... I'm gonna make my screen more fun. Okay, so this mysterious, um, the, so the fun answer is this mysterious trade um, advisor might be a figure like James Bond, because some of our traders are really into um, kind of this meme of uh, filming and and kind of this gangster movies. So um, that might be kind of the fun answer. But the serious answer is really, you know, there are a lot of things which are happening with LCX, which you don't see. Um, so we are not publishing all the kind of hundreds of pages we filed to regulator to partners, the kind of, um, you see the partnerships which happen, but a lot of things are happening in the background, which actually are not resulting in immediate uh, actions. So these are things um, which also kind of reflect on this mysterious advisor because we actually have somebody who is advising us since the launch of LCX, but um, due to his role, he's not allowed to sign an official advisory agreement or uh, announce it on the website. So that's why we did kind of similar update calls uh, with him, um, like with you and the other advisors, but we are not allowed to mention it. And it's a uh, Kind of symbol probably for all the mysterious and secret things which we are doing in the background and nobody knows i can tell you we are working our ass off and trying to do the best and um, that's how i want to end up the with the lcx blockchain session here terrific well really appreciate uh all all of the time of everyone who's on the uh, youtube live stream uh you know and i really appreciate your time monty this has been a fascinating journey yeah, thank you, Miku, and then hope to see you soon in person again. Yeah, we're well, really to San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Bye bye.